1812, sometimes referred to as the Second War for Independence, was declared by Congress on June 18, 1812. There were three main causes for the war, trade, impressment, and trouble with the indigenous people along our western borders. You see, the Brits were arming the Native Americans, more correctly, Tecumseh's Confederacy, to cause trouble along the Northwest Territory of our new republic. Uh, it seems uh, the Brits still had an issue with that whole independence thing. Well, anyways, second reason was due to Britain fighting a war with France. They didn't like the idea that the United States was trading with their enemy. So they did whatever it would take to interfere with America's trade. The British required all neutral ships must stop in England first before going to the continent. Now, on the other hand, Napoleon's Milan Decree of 1807 stated any ship which touched an American port would be considered a legitimate prize of war. America was stuck in the middle. We had a right to trade with any country since we were non-belligerents, but it was getting to the point that President Monroe was considering war not only with Britain, but with France at the same time. Now, the third reason for the war was the impressment of American sailors into the British Navy. American ships and sailors were targeted by the Royal Navy. Their British captains would demand that merchant ships flying the U.S. ensign Eve two on the high seas be allowed to be boarded so that they could search for contraband or deserters. The Royal Navy found it difficult to distinguish between British and American seamen, so they just took whoever they needed. By 1812, it is estimated that 15,000 Americans had been impressed into the British Navy. The British were so brazen that they would stop and board American flag naval vessels. On May 1st, 1811, HMS Guerrier stopped the brig USS Spitfire off Sandy Hook in New Jersey. They boarded the vessel and impressed Seaman John DeGio, a U.S. citizen. So by June of 1812, President Monroe, the Congress, and the American people were demanding war with Britain. There was just one slight problem. America did not really have a navy to defend its merchant fleet or its coastline. At the outbreak of the war, the Royal Navy had 85 vessels in American waters, while the United States Navy was composed of eight frigates, 14 smaller sloops and brigs, and no ships of the line. So, America was outgunned, so to speak, going into a war over freedom of the seas. However, America did have an extremely large merchant fleet of the time. The American merchant fleet had been rotting in eastern seaports due to President Jefferson's Embargo Act of 1807. That was the result of the Chesapeake Leopard Affair. See my previous video. Now, the Act and subsequent trade acts were a disaster for America's international trade. When war was declared, American merchantmen saw an opportunity to make money and wasted no time in asking for letters of mark from the Congress. More sailors signed on as privateers than joined the U.S. Navy during that war. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 11 of the U.S. Constitution states, Congress has the power to declare war grant letters of mark and reprisals, and make rules concerning capture on land and water. Now, Black's Law Dictionary defines a letter of mark as a license giving authority to a private citizen and allowing a citizen to engage in reprisals against citizens or vessels of another nation. If American merchant seamen could not trade peacefully, then they were going to trade by force. They would become privateers. Their battle cry was free trade and sailors' rights. Now, a private Tier is a private person or ship that engages in maritime warfare or commerce warfare under a commission of war. Any ship or cargo they capture from a belligerent nation is then sold at auction and the proceeds are split between the government, the ship's owners, and the ship's crew. They are not pirates. They are entrepreneurs, legally licensed by their country to go out and become buccaneers. Obviously, for a country with a small navy, this is a way to conduct commerce warfare. American seamen jumped at the opportunity. Within days of the declaration of war, American merchantmen were arming their vessels and sending representatives to Washington, D.C., requesting letters of mark from Congress. In total, Congress authorized over 500 letters of mark, which President Madison signed. So how did a privateer operate? Now, unlike ships of the line, privateers did not want to get into a slugfest with the British Navy. The job was commerce raiding, attacking unarmed and lightly armed merchant vessels. The privateers did arm their ships with cannon. Now, the website On the Water Maritime Museum stated, the last thing any privateer wanted to do was fight, 
battles risk injury to sailors, damage to ships, and loss of profit. But the privateers had to demonstrate that they were willing to attack and even board an enemy vessel. Officers armed themselves with swords and firearms. Crews were issued weapons. Most seamen preferred the short-barreled pistol, a musket, and shotgun. They were easier to handle in a shipboard fight. Now the privateer would use its cannons to disable the merchant ship just enough to enable the privateer to come alongside and board the vessel. Sometimes the enemy ship would surrender without resisting. Other times a short and in some cases bloody hand-to-hand -hand fighting would take place. Or the privateer would pound the merchantman until their colors were struck and then take, take it over. Either way, the goal was to make a profit, not to destroy the ship or its valuable cargo. The American privateer was a colorful character. For instance, Captain Thomas Boyle, born in Marblehead, Mass. in 1775, he went to sea at the age of 10. By 17, he commanded several vessels for a French merchant out of Baltimore. When the war started, Boyle took command of the schooner Comet. He made three cruises in it. The first, the Caribbean, was between July 11th and October 7th, 1812. He captured four ships with a combined value of $400,000. Now, in 2021 dollars, that would be approximately $8 million. On his second cruise, November 25th, 1812 to March 17th, 1813, he went to the Brazilian coast. He captured five prizes, but unfortunately, the British recaptured all of them, so he didn't make any money on that cruise. His third cruise was very profitable. From October 29, 1813 to March 9, 1814, Boyle cruised the Caribbean and he grabbed 20 prizes. Now, the legislation concerning, concerning the distribution of prize money at that time stated a captain operating independently received 15% of the total assessed value of the prize. Boyle was becoming rich. Now, after his third crew won the comet, Boyle headed to New York to take command of the Chaucer. That's the French word for hunter. He's a top sail schooner. He left New York Harbor on July 30, 1814. 14 bound for Britain by way of the Grand Banks. Now on this cruise, Boyle captured 18 vessels. What made this cruise memorable, memorable was Boyle's impertinence and bravado. When the British announced the blockade of America's eastern seaports, Boyle, who was now off the British Isles, issued his own proclamation declaring that he and the Chaucer were putting the entirety of the British Isles in a state of strict and rigorous blockade. To add insult to injury, Boyle had the proclamation printed up and posted in Lloyd's Coffee House in London. London. Needless to say, shipping insurance rates became a little more expensive. The Royal Navy was not amused. They had to divert 14 sloops of war and three frigates to patrol for the Chaucer along the northern and western coasts of England. How effective was the blockade? Who's to say? However, on that three months cruise, like I said, Boyle netted 18 prizes. Captain Boyle's success as a privateer can be attributed to a number of things. He had an emphasis on drill. His crews were proficient in handling the sails, the ship, and operating the guns. And as you can see, this paid dividends during his encounters with the enemy vessels. Then there's Captain John Ordronel. He was one of the most successful American privateers of the War of 1812. He commanded two ships, the Marengo and the Prince de Neufachelle. He captured and destroyed approximately 30 British merchant ships. He outran 17 British warships and captured prizes worth $250,000 up to $300,000. The man was a legend. Now, between June 23, 1812 and October, mid-October 1812, Ordonneau captured four British ships with the sale of three and its cargo. Ordonneau had the money to purchase his own ship, a faster, more heavily armed ship than the Marengo. See, due to the success of the American commerce raiders, the British were forced to upgun, basically, their ships. Now, the American shipbuilders responded very simply by building larger, faster, and more heavily armed privateering vessels. Ordronel purchased the Prince de Neufa Chatel, an armed schooner in response to Britain's escalation of heavily armed ships. Now, on October 28, 1813, he took command of his new ship and sailed her to Cherbourg for fitting out. It wasn't ready for, for sea yet. The new Fachel was basically unarmed at this time, but on January 18, 1814, on the way to Cherbourg, he captures the British ship Hazard. Ordinal arrived in Cherbourg on the 27th of 1814. The ship was fitted out and armed with 18 guns, then he put to sea in March of 1814. Now, Ordinal cruised the English Channel, capturing six British ships while being hotly pursued by two Royal Naval ships. 
His second cruise took him down to the coast of Portugal and back to the English Channel. By the time Audrino and the new, new Chatel arrived back in Baltimore in July of 1814, he had captured over 20 British prizes. Now, the lure of big prize money was countered with the danger of the mission of the privateers, as Audrino found out in October of 1814. He had brought the Neuf Chatel back to American waters, and while off in Nantucket on October 11th, she was spotted by the HMS Endymion, a 40-gun frigate captained by Henry Hope. Audrino was outgunned and outmanned. Ordinarily, Neuf Chatel would be manned by 150 men. However, she was down to only 40 men because every time he captured a British ship, he had to put a prize crew on board to take that captured ship back into neutral port to be sold. Now, in his book, The Naval War of 1812, Teddy Roosevelt describes this battle. HS, HMS Endymion went after the new Fashel at 8 p.m. at Carm, having come on. The frigate dispatched five boats containing 111 men under the command of First Lieutenant Abel Hawkins to take the brigantine. While the latter pulled up the boarding nettings, loading the guns with grape and bullets, and prepared herself in every way for the coming encounter. She opened fire on the boats as they drew near, but they were soon alongside, and a most desperate engagement ensued. Some of the British actually cut through the netting and reached the deck, but they were killed by the privateersmen, and in a few minutes, one boat was sunk, three others drifted off, and the launch had been captured. The slaughter had been frightful. The Americans lost seven killed and 15 badly wounded, and nine slightly wounded. The British lost 28 killed and 37 wounded. 18 wounded men were captured, and another 10 unwounded men were captured. It was the most desperate conflict, and remembering how short-handed the brigantine was, it reflects the highest honor on the American captain and his crew. A privateer was a deadly business. Now, there were instances of privateers mistaking heavily armed British frigates as merchantmen and attacking only to realize their mistake and having to fight their way out. In a letter to his agent, Captain Nathaniel Shaler recounted his run, running with a very large British frigate that he had mistaken for a transport. His letter was reprinted in the Rhode Island Republican, number 49, volume 5, Thursday, March 3rd, 1814. The letter was written on January 1st, 1813, while at sea. In the letter, Shaler praises the extraordinary heroism of two sailors during the fight. Her first broadside killed two men and wounded six others. My, office con conduct my officers conducted themselves in a way that would have done honor to a more permanent service. The name of one of my poor fellows who was killed ought to be registered in the Book of Fame and remembered with reverence as long as bravery is considered a virtue. He was a black man by the name of John Johnson. A 24-pound shot struck him in the hip and took away all the lower part of his body. In this state, the poor brave fellow lay on the deck and several times exclaimed to his shipmates, Fire away, my boys! No haul down colors! There was also another black man by the name of John Davis, and he was struck in much the same way. He fell near me and several times requested to be thrown overboard, saying he was only in the way of the others. He went on to say, when America has such sailors, she has little to fear from the tyrants of the ocean. If a privateer was unlucky enough to be captured, life became extremely uncomfortable. The captured crew would be placed in the hole of the ship, most likely in irons, put on half rations and transported back to England where they would be incarcerated on a prison ship. These were derelict ships no longer seaworthy. Now, after that, they would be sent to Dartmoor Prison. Now, this prison was built between 1806 and 1808 to house the French POWs from the war with France. By 1813, American seamen were being confined there. Approximately 5,000 privateers were captured and sent to Dartmoor Prison, where they led a monotonous existence of bad food, lack of clothing, mistreatment by the guards, very little medicine. Now, interesting thing though, when the war ended in February of 1815, these men were still retained in prison well into April. And it was during this period that the infamous Dartmoor prison massacre happened. On April 6, 1815, at 6 p.m., the American POWs were in the prison marketplace selling or buying whatever they could. The alarm sounded. British soldiers were drawn up along one end of the square. Captain Shortland ordered his men to fire into the prisoners. The Americans scattered and tried to make it into the individual prison blocks. 
When the smoke cleared, seven Americans were dead, 60 men wounded. A joint investigation was held immediately after the incident. Depositions were taken from the American prisoners. The findings of the commission were a disappointment to the American. Shortland was absolved of any wrongdoing. The British government did make restitution to the family of the murdered prisoners and set up pensions for the men who were disabled. Eventually, the American POWs were repatriated. However, approximately 250 American seamen never left Dartmoor prison. The war ended on February 16, 1815 with the signing of the Treaty of Ghent. The United States had sent out 500 plus privateers of those 148 were captured by the Royal Navy, and only 207 ever took prizes. However, those 207 ships captured over 1,300 British ships. The American privateers were able to alleviate the trading balance by providing the United States with desperately needed consumer and military goods. It's estimated that American privateers captured over $40 million of shipping and goods. In 2021 dollars, that would be well over $800 million. Now, Captain Thomas Boyle survived the war. He did return to the merchant service, and unfortunately he died October 12, 1825, at the age of 50. Now, John Ordino, he became wealthy due to his privateering adventures. He settled in New York City in 1816 and married Jean Marie Elizabeth Charaton. They had four daughters and a son. He died in Cartagena, Columbia, South America in 1814, and while his body was being transported back home, it seems the crew threw it overboard because they were suspicious of a dead man on a ship and they had almost sank from a storm. Now, in honor of this man, the United States commissioned DD-2617 during World War II and named it after him. Dears in the War of 1812, please explore the links in the description below. This is our history. It is our heritage. If you like this video, hit the like button and subscribe to my channel and leave a comment below. I post a new video every two weeks. Thank you for watching.